<clears throat> Show your Hello and welcome to Elder Interviews, a creation spirituality community's innovation where we explore the lives and experience of our creation spirituality elders, women, and men whose spirits shine with the hard won wisdom of the sage. My name is Penny Andrews from Wisconsin, and I'm delighted to be your host this session. It is also my pleasure to introduce CS Community's leader extraordinaire, Gail Ransom, who will be speaking with John Robinson, another um, member of the Elder Interview Team, and a beloved member of the CS Community. Gail is a musician, writer, creation spirituality minister, and president of Creation Spirituality Communities. Her life's work has been nurturing spiritual growth primarily through the arts. Gail has co-led a creation spirituality-based worship service, the Worship Jam in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for over 12 years. Newly retired, she plunged right into the wonderful gathering we had at Asheville with the um, creation spirituality community of Howard Hangers called Jubilee. Um, Gail received her DMIN in 2010 from Wisdom University and has been on the board since 2013. In a moment, Gail will be introducing Reverend Dr. John Robinson. We have been doing these elder interviews for over a year now, and they have enriched all of our, our team who plans them sensibilities and Hopefully, the people that have joined us from time to time and been a part of this community. Uh, before we begin, uh, the interview will run about 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer and reflection time. So save your questions and comments until we open the floor for everyone to participate. These, these interviews will be recorded and archived on the CSC website for all to enjoy later on. Here is Gail to introduce our distinguished colleague and guest. Hello, hello, welcome. I am so pleased to introduce you to John Robinson, who is actually the, the spirit behind these meetings because they started as a result of our 2016 creation spirituality gathering when John began to teach some classes about the spirituality of aging and I was hooked and he opened up a whole new understanding of what it meant to be past 60 and um, he inspired a lot of us and so we put together these interviews together and how sweet it is finally to hear from John himself. He is the person who is redefining the spirituality of aging through his many books and presentations. And he will help us rewrite our myths, redefine our senior moments, and convince <laughs> us that to be an aging human is to be ever moving closer to the divine. Yes. John Robinson is a clinical psychologist with a second doctorate in ministry, an ordained interfaith minister, the author of nine books and numerous articles, book chapters, guest blogs on the psychology spirituality and mysticism of the new aging and frequent speaker at conscious aging conferences across the country. John is also a member of our elder interview team and he has conducted many of the interviews beforehand including the last one with uh, Howard Hanger. So we're glad to turn the tables on you, John. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's really a wonderful privilege to be here, and I have to admit it's kind of amazing and kind of daunting to be on the other side of this interview process. But I, I really appreciate the chance to tell my story of aging because it, it, it means so much to me and it has shown me so much. So, wow, I'm excited to be here. And you're going to start with a song, is that right? And I'm going to start with a song. Yeah, so I've been writing songs in my old age, and I'd like to start with part of one to kind of set the mood for this interview, it's autobiographical and starts in my childhood and, and brings me, in the, in the first uh, couple uh, verses, brings me face to face with the mystery of old age. And it's called, I Remember. And it goes like this. Mm -hmm.
I remember when I was little and the magic was still everywhere. There were cowboys on my bedroom walls, fireflies in the cool night air, lightning in the summer storms, winter snow in my hair, a mother who called my name and the father's love to share. Well, I remember walking down that lane to the bottom where I met this old man. He said, hey there, young fella. You're a long ways from home in another land. He asked me my age. I said, seven, sir. He said, ah, that's grand, but it's miles and miles from home and a long time to the place I am. The seasons turn, the years go by, we chase our dreams, we learn to fly, the world moves on, we sing our song, and then one day, the summer's gone. So that's the first part of this, is where me as a little boy heads down the hill on one of my first adventures, you know, away from the yard and everything. And I come upon this nice old man and he just gives me this most mysterious sort of message. And so at the end of the song, I've kind of reached his age and I have a different view on what he says. So that's my song and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> We're glad you're there. Yeah, actually, actually, you came even to the aging process at a very young age, didn't you, John? I got nailed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. can you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, you know, I would love to. Um, I, I want to tell this story. It's about my transition from being a busy clinical psychologist in a very active practice to suddenly, or not suddenly, but over time becoming a, an aging mystic and, and, and writing about the psychology and spirituality of aging and, and particularly this new time of life we're in. So this is my story. And uh, it, 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 even though it's a little bit shocking and unusual and perhaps even strange, I think at the underlay, it's also universal to something that happens to us in aging because aging is, in fact, at some level, a death and rebirth process. So here's what happened. It all began with the feeling of hands working inside my heart. Very strange. One weekend I had this weird feeling that there were hands working inside my heart. And, and I thought to myself, I'm a kind of a spiritual guy. I thought to myself, oh, this is kind of sweet. Maybe, you know, maybe God's working on something in there. I'm going to have this new, new experience of transformation. But it also didn't quite feel that way. It felt ominous. It, it felt dark. It felt frightening. Well, I didn't know what to do with that thought, so I put it aside. A couple weeks later, uh, after a really long day, like six or seven clients in a men's group, I come home from work and I feel my, my heart banging around inside my chest, you know, like, like a, a salmon in, in my rib cage, flopping around. And I realized, oh, okay, that's atrial fibrillation. I had it once before went to the emergency room, they treated it medically, it resolved, I went home, everything was fine, so I guess I have to go back to the emergency room again. So my wife and I drive in and uh, go to the emergency room and they say, yes, indeed, you are in atrial fibrillation. Uh, and they tried the medicine, but the medicine didn't work. So this, the guy finally says to me, you know, you have to be cardioverted. That means, you know, the paddles to the chest, the shock to the heart, you stop and restart the heart. Well, I knew it was a very safe procedure, and the, the mounting horror and fear that began to rise up in me was, was, was enormous. I, I could barely stay in my skin. I, I could not stand this sense of terror that began to rise up in me. So, and I talked to this young guy that I just had the procedure, and he says, ah, it's a piece of cake. Don't worry about it. You know? So I sit in the emergency room for like two hours, you know, 
and they're so kind to me. They could have said, hey, you know, you know, buck it up, guy. Let's get on with it. But they just let me struggle with myself. And finally, finally, I realized there was no choice. I had to bite the bullet. So I, I said, I agreed. So I go into this room, this special room for, it's like a surgical room for defibrillation. Lie on this thing. And my wife is now told, she was with me then, was now told she has to leave. But she leaves and then sneaks back in to hide behind a screen because she does not want to leave me alone in this. She's just so, so, so loving. And, and so anyway, so I lie on this table. They, they put the IV in and they, they give you a short acting anesthesia. So you go out for four or five minutes. So I go out. I come back. I look up at the, at the doc and I say, am I converted? And he says, yes, you're Jewish. Well, with that little bit of insane levity, I, I just feel so great. I feel like I've dodged a bullet. I feel like everything's fine. Oh my God, I can go home, it's over with. So I, I go home and it's not over with. Uh, I begin to feel this e enormous feeling of exhaustion and fatigue. I can, you know, I can barely, I can barely focus a and then, it, I get these other strange sensations in my chest. It feels rubbery and numb and, and bruised and torn and tingly and just very strange stuff. And I go back to my cardiologist and go back to my primary care guy and they both say, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, it's, a, it's just, you know, something else is going on, but it's not medical. So I go back to my therapist. So I've been in therapy as a psychologist for years and years. I happen to love therapy. I love doing therapy and I love being in therapy because you, you just learn so much. It's such a rich space to grow yourself. But anyway, so I go back. I've been out of therapy for a while. So I go back into therapy and I say, Paul, it, about the second session, I say, you know, it feels to me in some really weird way like I just came out of open heart surgery. And, and then I remembered, well, you know, I did have open heart surgery when I was 14. You know, for correction of, a, of an atrial septal defect in you know between the the wall of the upper chambers, and and uh, and then I began to have flashbacks. The more I talked, and then I suddenly realized this feeling of hands working inside my heart w was not a metaphor; it was a literal experience. And then it dawned on me in the most horrible ways that I had awakened in surgery. You can wake up in surgery. It's called anesthesia awareness. Uh, it happens when the anesthesia levels drop too low to suppress consciousness. So you start waking up, but the neuromuscular blocking agents, the curare-like chemicals, paralyze you to such an extent you can't fire a single motor neuron. So you can't say, hey, wait, I'm here, you know, or blink your eyes or do anything to let them know you're awake. It kept getting worse. I, I mean, I, the, the tearing and the pulling and the splitting of my chest and the hands working inside of my heart, and it's cold. They turn down the operating room really low. I am freezing. Uh, I, I feel splayed open, and, it, and I'm just a 14-year-old little boy. I mean, I cannot grasp this horror. And, and it was made worse, in effect, because in those days, they didn't prepare you for surgery. As They, they just your parents dropped you off. They didn't spend the night. You know, the next morning you went in. The night before, they, they wanted to reassure me that the whole thing was fine. So they took me upstairs to see the other kids who had come out of surgery. Oh, my God, they're in oxygen tents. They look pasty. There are tubes running in and out of their noses and coming out of their chest. <laughs> I was not reassured at all. But in any case, back to my, my flooding memories, it felt like it was a living autopsy. And I had this image as I kept working with this of, of a of a frozen child caked in ice, in clear ice. And, and in a sense, that was me. And I recognized at that time that my job in this healing was that I had to melt that ice and to feel that child again. I mean, the good news is that I, as a therapist, I'd been down this, this journey into the depths of people's sorrow and grief and pain. A lot of times I knew the way in and I knew the way back, but I also knew that it was really, really painful and it was really painful. So there were times in my therapist's office when I would be lying on the floor, sobbing uncontrollably because the pain was so Un unbearable and I was so inconsolable I mean it was just went on and finally as I cut my practice back to half time 
And even that didn't work. And finally, after 15 months of trying to, to continue to be a therapist, I realized that I was not going to get well unless I, unless I let go. So I closed my practice and said goodbye to so many wonderful people that I, I cared for and I loved and I, I was taking care of. And, and it was done. I mean, this, and this, curiously, this atrial defibrillation experience was 40 years to the month of my original surgery. My original surgery had left me with a ticking time bomb that had to open up some point. And I was grateful that, it didn't, that I didn't experience it at the time. My, my, my 14-year-old psyche split off this trauma because I don't think my ego could have, to, could have tolerated it at that age. But now, at this later age, when I had more, more depth to myself, I, I had to relive it. And that's, that's what was the beginning of my aging experience. So I give in. I surrender, I close my practice, I, I sit in the ashes of my life, my, my professional community's gone, my, my, most of my professional friends are gone, my income's gone, my identity's gone. This is your basic via negativa, you know, on, on steroids. So what I did, when in doubt, I, as I go back to school, and I looked around and I found the University of Creation Spirituality, and, and, I, and I loved what Matt had to say about the mystics, because I've always I know, I've been a mystic since I was a child, but I didn't really understand what it meant. But it gave me a chance to, to go back into a process where I could keep working my trauma. My, my material wasn't open with, I had to keep working it. So with every module that I went through, I did another thing to, to sort this out. One time I remember having sheets of, of, of paper, big sheets of you know, poster paper, and I, the first one was of my chest closed, you know, just a chest. Then it, it opened to, 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 to my ribs and sternum, and, th and then there was a cut in my sternum, and then it opened to my heart, and then, then there was a cut in my heart, and then it opened, and I found the Buddha inside. It was the most strange things that I don't remember putting them in there. It was just, I was just opening this horror that I had to live, and that there was something. And then there was this other one I just wanted to share was, that I did this wood carving, you know, where art is mad. I, I, and so I took this piece of wood and it so reminded me of my heart surgery that I want to show it to you. So here's, I, I think you can see it. Here's the, the knife going down into the wall of my heart. And I worked on this for like two hours, working on it, working on it, working on it. And when I, but when I was finally done, I stood back and I looked at it. I don't know if you can see it. And it, suddenly looked like a bird flying. And it, it was like it was like one of those gestalt shifts. Suddenly it went from horror to transcendence to to healing to to um to to, to a new life. I, I, it's like like a like a dove. And that was the my experience over and over again at Creation Spirituality, taking this thing and I, I think therapy needs to have more than just therapy it needs to have spirituality and it needs to have art and this was part of this obviously became part of my therapy so then and then after that i mean my childhood trauma was was uh, looking back felt like a, a, an adolescent indigenous initiation you know like when boys get initiated or, or more even more profoundly when shamans get initiated they often are in their subjective experience torn to pieces murdered terrified ripped apart and then somehow put back together in a new way except that for me nobody knew what happened i didn't know what happened it, it was never put back together until 40 years later and so this is the process that happened that, uh, that allowed me to finally put myself back together and find a new wholeness that, that hadn't been there for most of my life. And then I went to this interfaith seminary, this because I wasn't done yet, uh, at, called the Chaplaincy Institute in Berkeley. Lovely, lovely place. Founded by Gina Rose Halpern, who I just interviewed for our series, who came from UCS. And anyway, I realized later what I wanted in the ordination process was to be blessed for coming through this nightmare and coming into aging in an entirely new and, and, and creative way. And, and it's like it completed my, my journey into, into, the, into the new aging. So then after that, I mean, my, my UCS, I published my UCS dissertation with Matt's endorsement on Finding Heaven Here. And I, then all these books came pouring out of me because it's like I went from the 
via negativa and suddenly into the via creativa and I could not stop writing. I mean, I would go for five or six hours at a time and my wife would call downstairs and say, you know, it was dinner time at seven o'clock. And so I, you know, I didn't even know what, what time it was. It was so, so powerful for me. And then I came into this new sense of what aging is. So that's what I want to share with you is well, how I, I wrote this book called The Three Secrets of Aging. And it's really what I learned from this life shattering experience that took away my life and yet gave me something so wonderfully new, but it never would have happened if I hadn't given up, if I hadn't surrendered. Um, I have that book here. Here's a, the book, The Three Secrets of Aging. It's a, it's profound, not, oh. even, not even thick, but very profound. <laughs> and in it, I just, I just I'm struck with your Buddha that you found inside your Yeah. Chair. And because I was also struck in your book about you talking about self-transcendence. Could you tell us what you mean by that? Well, you know, and that's part of the initiation experience always involves the death of the old self. It's a death and rebirth experience. Like in indigenous cultures, it's, it's the death of the boyhood or childhood and then the birth of, of our adult role in the tribe and our vision for ourselves in this new life. So, but it always involves giving up who you thought you were, giving up your identity, your, your self idea. I mean, for me, it, everything I was, was I was a psychologist. I'd been wanting to do this for all my life and I was doing it for most of my life and it was gone. So the self transcendence is in aging, and this is really key, you can hang on to the old self, but there comes a time when it's sterile, when it's empty, when it's no longer even true because you're not that anymore. And if you keep telling the old, reciting the old story of you, you won't let go and you won't have this passage from one life to the next because the initiation needs you to give up one and, and, and have, a, have enough patience and trust to believe a new one will come. And, and, and in fact, what happens, I believe, is that as you let this part go and as you wait in your via negativa and as you wait in the quiet, a new birth comes from the... From the um, from the growth of your true self, that the soul gives birth in the true self to a new blossom on the spiritual tree of your life. So suddenly, my new blossom was I could not stop writing. I, I, there's, I, it's like I suddenly got that this is why I came into the world. I, I've been waiting all my life to do this writing. My grandmother <laughs> said, John, when I was in, in high school, I think she said, John, you're a writer. And I, and I didn't say it, but I wanted to say, Gammy, you're crazy. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but I think she was right. So I finally got there, you know, and I, and I began to have this. So that's what self-transcendence is to leave that. And you know, what's really interesting is the second secret of aging has to do with the transformation of self and consciousness. And the self-transcendence means also that you are not who you think you are. And if you just are willing to let the story of you quiet down, the chattering mind quiet down in this new silence of negativa and waiting, there will be an awareness of the consciousness that's always been holding that story of you. And when that story becomes quiet, you turn your awareness into this consciousness and you begin to learn what the mystics have been telling us all our lives. This is why aging is, a, is an enlightenment in slow motion. We begin to, to have the insights the mystics have been telling us that we don't have to think about it, they just are there. And the insights are things like this. You discover that consciousness is not just in you, you are in it. And it is the consciousness of the universe, of the cosmos, of the divine. When I move into that space, for me, every, the consciousness is far less in me. It's like it's here, it's everywhere, and it's alive, and it's aware of me, and I am aware of it, and it begins to fill me with itself. And so you have this remarkable process of, of, of evolution of your experience of your own consciousness in a way that I think gives birth to a new way of being in the world as enlightened elders. And that's really, I'm yakking on about this, but that's really my message, my experience. You're muted. Sorry. Um, yep. uh, the three secrets are first initiation, right? And so you're talking yep. about initiation. And the next one, it was trans transformation. And then the last one is revelation. Yes. 
So the revelation is, I love this one too. And it's also, it was really the subject of my, of my UCS dissertation. You know, we, we don't see the world we're in. We grow up, when we're young children, you know, at four and five, we're living in, in our senses. We're really living where, where, what is. And then over time with education and peers and parents and lectures and stuff, you begin to, well, a Buddha said it. He says, we are what we think. All that we are arises with our work, with, with, our, with our words, with our words we make, with our thoughts, with our thoughts we make the world. And what he's really referring about is to this left hemisphere world of identity, time, and story, who we think we are so that we name and label and explain everything and then stop seeing it. But in this new stage, in this, in this more silent consciousness, in this intensifying of sensory perceptual awareness, you begin to see the world without thought and it becomes ever immensely more beautiful. It becomes luminous, radiant, uh, alive, it becomes filled with consciousness, even things that are not supposed to be conscious. It's like Thomas Berry says, it's not just a collection of objects, it's a communion of subjects, and we are part of this consciousness that flows through everything. And when I've been studying mystic, you know, major mystical experiences for 20 years, and I began to realize this is what the big mystical experiences reveal, that it's all one thing and it's all alive and it's the sacred being. So we, we never left the garden, you know, we just, well, the garden was always here. We left by going into this world of thought. And as soon as we quiet the world of thought and reawaken the world of perception, particularly in the state of awe, you discover, and you can do this as an experiment. You know, if you look at a pencil or a flower or even your hand and you look at it ever more intensely in silent, without thought, you begin to realize, I don't know what this is. It's far more beautiful than I ever imagined, and increasingly it becomes brighter, more colorful, more luminous, and holy. And that is the, the entrance into the divine world and heaven on earth. And the mystics have been telling us that heaven on earth is here for, for thousands of years. So those are the three secrets. So coming into aging is, just, is actually, despite the awfulness of it, is an opportunity for, for profound transformation. You say that in your book that um, we will soon have a third of the population in aging. And you see this as a potential for bringing divine energy and appreciation and wisdom uh, to our species. Can you imagine that? I mean, in, in 1900, you know, like our average lifespan was 45 and 4%, 4% of the people in the world were, were over 65. In 2030, more than a third of us will be over 65. And in, in developed countries, if you get to be 65, on the average, you have another 16 years for men, 19 for women. So we have literally a new developmental stage in the human life cycle. And we wonder, what is it for? But this is what it's for. It's for the awakening of the soul in the world, of, of the consciousness, so that we can be a, a conscious influence to change how things are. Interestingly, the research says that, that Countries with older populations are much less likely to start wars. I think as older people, we live, ha we, the evidence also says we're happier when we're older. So that we are happier, we are more present, we are more content. We love just because we love, because it's our nature now to love. It could be a different kind of world. That's, that's the view you gave me at the, uh, in 2016. Good. I was amazed when I thought of us uh, suddenly a, a, a team of golden, mystics going out. All of us. We're all of us going to do that. Um, you gave us some tasks. You say there's some tasks we have for aging. So help us, help us get where you are. Uh, what, what are our tasks? Maybe you want to start with initiation? Just one for each one, maybe. What should we well, do for initiation to get our initiation? Well, I think for initiation, we, we, one of the things we have to do is, is accept the fact that it's gonna, it is changing, that one day, it's like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, you, you just realize, hey, you know, I'm not in Kansas anymore. It may look the same, but it's different. And something, it, whether it's a big event, you know, like a health crisis, or whether it's a bunch of little ones adding up, or whether it's one that just summarizes it symbolically, you realize you've entered a new world. The task is to open your eyes to it, to not try to rush back and recreate the old self, which is now only going to be a false self, but to let yourself grow like a garden. That's really the task. Hmm. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. For that stage, for that item. For that stage, okay. And yeah, then, we have to release the identity and the roles and the purposes, the ambitions of the old. You know, Odysseus, I wrote, so I write this book about men coming home, and Odysseus is sort of the classic warrior. You know, he's out there conquering everything in, in, in this vile, awful, disgusting, hateful Trojan War. Ten years it goes on, he hasn't seen his child for ten years or his wife. It's finally over. He's starting to come home. It takes him ten years to get home because he's got so many things he has to work out. And each of his adventures is a task, one of these tasks that we're talking about for him to come to terms with before he's able to leave the warrior mode and come home to love. Hmm. So oh, releasing these roles, discovering the value of an aging body, learning to grieve, these are all tasks of aging. Mm -hmm. He also talked about longing for God. And I thought and maybe in those, those 20 years of this warrior coming home is that there's a longing to be home, but that's kind of what takes us through these, from my interpretation. Yes, it's really coming home. Yeah, and you know, when we're little, we, we have this sort of ineffable kind of nostalgia for, for this original time of innocence. And, and that really was, we were coming into consciousness in the divine world, and then we left it. So longing to come home is to say, God, I spent all these years pursuing my identity and getting things and you know, building a life and getting insurance policy and all that stuff. And, that, and somewhere along the way, I've lost my soul and I've lost my way. I, like Odysseus, I need to come home to what matters most, which is I just want to love. Uh, and, I, and, you know, it's so interesting that this shows up in neuropsychology, too. The left brain is all about this, this conquering out there in the world, this thinking, doing, talking, naming. The right brain doesn't have access to speech, so it can't, it can't tell us, so it waits for us to quiet down enough so it can come alive. And when it comes alive, it reveals an entirely new world. Just like, you know, that book, Jill Bo Taylor, My Stroke of Insight, she's a neuroscientist, has this huge stroke on the left side, and starts having these incredible mystical experiences. And, and when she gets her speech function back with the rehab over, later, she's able to say, you know, I discovered that I was a figment of my own imagination for all those years, and actually, I am a being of light pouring love into the world. See, that's the transition from the left brain to the right brain that is possible in aging. You yeah, said in your book, I, I love this quote, you do not exist. You are not that person you think you are. Identity is a fiction. Yeah. You know, at first when I, this came to me and at first I thought, oh my God, I must really be depressed. <laughs> this is, this is really kind of like off the wall. And I, but I kept, it kept coming back to me. You don't exist. You don't exist. And, it's, and, it, and it was true. I didn't exist anymore in the way I thought I had. Mm -hmm. And when I finally accepted that, I felt this great sense of relief and this great sense of joy and freedom. Oh my God, it's all possible now. You know, the true self can blossom, but more than that, I don't have to be anything. Mm -hmm. You, I would like to, and I believe aging, aging asks us to engage the powerful process of initiation and transformation in order to witness and contribute to the building of heaven on earth. That's yes. A quote from you, and then you say later, do you see how important elders are? We yeah. are the stitching that holds life together the carriers and teachers of meaning and morality and the mature love through which the young are blessed. Yes. Yeah. The, I really believe that. I believe that when we are with others and we relax into this state of presence, and, in, and, and, and my last book was, is The Divine Human. It really talks about the experience when you silence this part of discovering that your consciousness and being are really the consciousness and being of the divine. And when you relax into that, you move into a flow, and you have you're, you're, you just affect the people around you just by being there. You don't have to do anything, and that from this space comes a kind of a loving that people can trust. And each of us doing that changes the vibration of the, of the entire con collective consciousness of the country and of the world. And that's why aging, I think, is one of the great gifts to humanity. For Jung said that aging would not exist if it did not have an evolutionary purpose, but he didn't really fully explain that. I think this is it. Hmm. Wow. Whoa. So what are our tasks for transformation and re revelation? How do, how do we get there once we've kind of let go and let our relax and let our right brain 
Yeah. Well, I think where we need to do is start, stop thinking so much and start disbelieving our thoughts. We keep trying to reconstruct this self. And it's much more about experiencing the consciousness behind the self. Okay. Now, people say, oh, I can't stop thinking. That's impossible. That'll never happen. But the, the trick is to move from the chatter of the left brain into your senses. For example, if you are walking on a balance beam in a gym, you cannot think about your taxes. You just can't. Or, or if you are threading a needle, or if you're painting trim, or if you're going down white water on a raft, you are, you are so present, your thinking stops, and, you, and that intense conscious sensory perceptual opening is in fact an opening to the divine world. That brings it into you. And then when you sit in your garden, or you do your dishes, it's a holy act. I mean, it's just like, oh, the, I love doing dishes, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's just something wet and, and, and easy and warm and bit, bit timely. And it just, and I think that's the way we can learn how to live. But we have to let go of this high gear, goal oriented, you know, the whole purpose of life is a five year plan. That stuff has to go away. Mm-hmm. You start deepening your experience of eternal values and, and moving into this mystical consciousness where where um even even senior moments turn out to be openings to enlightenment mm. you know senior moments we, we get all so, so afraid of those things so we think oh my god i'm losing it but what you're losing is a bunch of information you don't need anymore oftentimes you have to know everybody's birthday and the date and the history and the name of that singer and a place on the map when that stuff goes i mean your your mind is quieting and you can just open your eyes and look around and Go on. I mean, my my message is go into the garden, go into the woods, feel the presence of the presence there, and you will be peaceful, and you will begin to just ground yourself in and how to love in the world. Hmm. So, uh, what would you say now to your fourteen year old self? Oh, that's a lovely. Oh, I I you know I in my in my therapy I I came to just I held him over and over and over again. I, I watched him melt and I watched the ice melt away from him. It was painful and, I, and he was limp in my arms and he was so shattered. And over time he came back to life. And I think that the, I remember doing a lot of inner child work when I was a therapist and I found it so valuable is to, is to just take in this young part of you in, in whatever stage and just Bring him onto your lap and tell him you love him and make peace. And then ask him what he wants to do today. <laughs> you want to go out? You want to ride your bike? Let's ride your bike together, you know. Do the stuff that brings the inner child back to life because the inner child is the divine child. And that brings up the divine inside. Mm-hmm. And so, thank you. What about the seven-year-old? Let's, let's say, what would the seven, seven-year-old, no, what would you say to the man, the older man now? Oh. You were seven. Oh, you know, I would say, I, I wish I had learned to trust myself a lot earlier in life. If I know what I know now, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, I would have gone down a different road professionally. I would have gone much more quickly into, into the spiritual dimensions of, of, the, of the work. And I don't think I would have gone into religion so much, but I would have gone into some aspect of psychology and spirituality. And I would have started writing sooner, but I didn't. You know, I was such, a, in those days, you know, I was so unmirrored as a child. I just thought I had to be perfect and, and had to have to have it all together. So I, I was performing all the time. And I would have said to myself, John, you know all you need to know. Let go. Love your life. Love, trust what it is, and you will be fine. But I guess, you know, the, the gift of all this is that, oh, my God, I'm there now. I mean, it's never too late, and you don't have to think it's over with because the, the magic of, of your own inner transformation can happen in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, you have one more song to sing to us, don't you? Do you oh yeah. To- Would you like another song? Can you finish that song or do you have okay. another one instead? One well, why don't I finish that song and, and, and um, so you see, so you see where the little boy went. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, where is my song? So he's headed down the road, and the song begins now with with him um, 
growing, you know, going to school and, and getting back into his life. Or not, I mean, moving forward into his life after he met the man on the road. Well, I went to school, made some friends, fell in love with this girl again and again. I was shy, I was sweet. I failed at clicks, but I landed on my feet. Found my guitar, sang my songs, healed my heart, but it took so long. Made the grade, got a job, found this girl in a cool fern bar. <laughs> The kids were great, times were tough, we all got hurt, got a little bit scuffed up. We stuck it out, held our course, relied on love and we found that inner source. My grandma told me years ago, there's a force that you should know. Draw on it when you're hurt, when you're broken, you gotta put it first. The seasons turn, the years go by, we chase our dreams. We learn to fly, the world moves on, we sing our song, and then one day, the summer's gone. And now I'm old, I've become that man at the bottom of the lane in that other land. I understand just how he felt. I'm in his place and we play the hands were dealt. The setting sun is on my face. I feel its warmth, I feel its grace. Got so much, have no complaints, all I need is love's embrace. The seasons turn, the years go by. We chase our dreams, we learn to fly. The world moves on, we sing our song. And then one day, Summer's gone. Thank you. Thank you, John. Oh, my, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I hope I, I hope I did okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did beautiful. I think you did a little heart surgery on all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bearing my experience. It's still hard to talk about. It opened, well, but it did open my heart. I mean, the, the irony and the, and the symbolism is still stunning. Mm -hmm. I wonder, perhaps by opening the question and answer a little differently than we typically do, because um, you gave us so many aspects of your life. 
that if we, and, and maybe starting with you, Gail, but going up to Helene and then around the circle, if you're all seeing the circle the same way I am, just what one sentence, one word that from what we've heard John speak of that comes to mind. And Gail, are you willing to start us off? Oh, sure. Oh, just one word. Enlightened elder. Yeah, I think the enlightened elder and also the, the right brain and the left brain, letting the left brain go to let, uh, I appreciate that uh, advice on how to try to let that happen for myself. Thank you. Helene? Um, thank you, John. Um, I was reminded that I was fortunate to have um, elderly grandparents, mm. uh, one an Irish Catholic um, grandfather, Morgan Boyle, and another um, Italian grandfather, John Garenti. And that um, I felt that they had kind of um, come to a point in their life um, similarly to what you've spoken to. Um, because what I'd heard about them during their younger days was quite different than my experience of them as a child. Mm. And, um, acceptance in this um, coming to values that are so important um, and shedding the um, needs for other things in life. Um, so I'm a very appreciative of um, kind of recalling that about them. Mm. My grandfather in his own way was a very religious Catholic person and he he was able to be very kind um, at all mm. times. Mm. So I appreciate that about him and I've tried to do that in my own life. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. That, that is, that's the what's possible from us. I think what I was struck by was was the work you did with your 14 year old as you faced this major medical crisis and how they integrated um, to help you become the new you or the, the transformed you. That was very powerful mm -hmm. to hear. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was deep for me, so, so deep. That's Tom. Safe. I'm supposed to do it in few words. Uh, gracious alchemical synchronicities. Oh. <laughs> you could unpack that for a long time. Yes. Well, the other one is chironic enchantment. Oh, yes. Oh. That too. Well, and do you want to flesh that out more? I mean, this is pretty rich what's going on right now, too. Well, it, you know. I was a part of the Spiritual Emergence Network for many years, and psychologists and psychiatrists would call me uh, to check in to say, is their patient having a breakdown or a breakthrough? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and sometimes it was both, uh, but it, it, it moved me from that into understanding creation spirituality as enchantment yes. and, and kairos as God's gracious time for it. Mm -hmm. Not a calendar. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's an in-breaking and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in spite of ourselves, we get transformed. Mm -hmm. that, that's perfect. That's exactly it. And uh, uh, let's see. A uh, hundred thousand words after that, John and I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, without <we'll have> coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Tom. Um, wow. Uh, th th this was fun, uh, listening in person rather than talking. Um, I, I, I was struck with a number of things I have written down here to uh, talk to you about. Um, so the, the one I'll pick is, is you may comment several times about coming home, which just struck me uh, 
from a parallel universe of, uh, uh, you know, my, my dissertation, which we discussed mm -hmm. several months ago, was the outsider coming home. And, and the whole coming home business relating to letting go, um, from which my question follows, which I won't ask because I'm supposed to talk right now. Um, but it, what what struck me in it was the thought of uh, how our little me's tell us it's only me and I'm the only one experiencing this and uh, nobody understands um, how similar our, our actual lives and experiences are if we really look into it. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. At the Creation University, I made the Creation Spirituality Conference last week. I did an affinity group on just ask, on aging, and, and the simple question was, "What's aging like for you these days?" And it just was such so lovely flowing. The, the people sharing about common themes, wanting to move from doing to being, and wanting to slow down, and wanting to care for the world, and it just spun natural stuff. Yeah, thank you. It's good to not be alone. <laughs> Tom, he just, do you oh, have a, yeah, Tom, oh, you're on, I'm, I'm going to unmute you, Tom, and you can start again. Oh, there you go. Can you um, hear me? Now we can. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for your vulnerability and, and for sharing. You know, it's, it's a difficult uh, and I know how hard that is, so um, I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Appreciate your openness and your spirit. So this is and and John, do you want to respond to anyone before we go open it to question and answer? No, I think it's. Will you talk to me? Yes. Or yeah. Gail? No, I'm, I'm happy no. where I am. Okay. Yeah. Then maybe. Tom, we, you had a question. Do you want to kick it off? Sure. Um, it relates to um, several things you said, John, all of which kept bringing me to the same place of um, how we need to quiet our left brain, quiet the world of thoughts, um, come to an awareness that... Um, Consciousness isn't in us, but we're in consciousness, um, letting go, quieting down. Um, it was during my work with evolutionary spirituality where I was doing a lot of meditation. And sometimes our meditation was observing the observer. Um, and variations on that theme that um, I was able to come to that. And culturally, we do nothing to teach people to calm the mind, to think other than all the bullshit that's going on continuously. Um, how did you come to that, and how do you see us culturally getting to a point that we're doing stuff that Eastern traditions teach rather than what Western traditions teach? Well, those are really good questions, really, really good questions. How did I come to that, and how did we, how do we shake yeah, the cultures to, or our culture even, to buy, understand it? Um, I guess when I realized that I wasn't anybody and I wasn't anything and I, and I began to explore this in the consciousness that I began to realize that I, I look at myself and I wouldn't even recognize me. I mean, it just, this is only one thing in this whole vast oneness of things. And I wasn't in, even that interested in it anymore. And so I, and, and when I, and so then when I explored consciousness, it just, brought brought up so much like like joy i mean when, and 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 um freedom and and this 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 rush of love and this rush as if there was somebody else looking out my eyes 
than not me, not the me that I'm used to being. And I, again, I was struck with this, this split brain stuff in the 60s where they would cut the, the corpus callosum between the hemispheres. And, and they found that literally, and you can still see their research on YouTube, that there were two people living in there, two states. Two, and, so, and so, and the anecdotes were amazing. I mean, I mean the guy would be reaching out to, t to tie his tie with his right hand, left brain, because he wants to go, thinks he wants to go to work. The left hand, right brain would be untying it. He hugging his wife with one hand, he's pushing her away with another, lighting a cigarette with one and putting it out with the other. And I, it just struck me that there is somebody else living in here that, that we never, that, and that's the sunset has got to be the soul or the opening to the, to the divine mind. And if you just in silent awareness without thought, sense that, I mean, it, everything changes and your world is brand new again and it's so reinforcing you know it just keeps pulling you along i mean there's a lot of hard times in life but each one of these these stepping stones makes you more amazed at, at the simple magnificent gift of being alive so I, I so that's how it worked for me i mean i couldn't i just kept going further and further into this open space um and the and to the joy of it and, and to look and begin to try to understand what mystical activism is, because there's a longing, I think we all feel to, to heal the world, but, but the problem is we get stuck in doing things to the world, and, 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 and half the things we do bounce back on us because people don't like them, and we get into conflicts, and we argue, but there's something about being in this state of mystical consciousness that, that changes the vibration around us, that opens up this immense appreciation for the simple perfect beauty of what is and, and enlarges our boundaries so much that what happens what is happening to you is happening to me because we're no longer apart we're the same thing and that that is the kind of thing that will i that will i think pull more and more people into this process so how to change other people is tricky is a tricky business because you can't obviously you can't do it by telling them about it and lecturing at them, that is not going to work. I think it has to do almost more with your your presence, your state of consciousness. Um, and then I think the practices people are talking about more in the world, like like uh, mindfulness practices and Tai Chi, and I think those are all really valuable. I mean, because they do take you out of here and put you into a much more wide open sensory space. I think there just needs to be the next step along that that continuum of education that says, and by the way, the consciousness that you're aware of is not yours. You know, by the way, that's God. And don't think about this because you'll go right into your left brain. But if you, if you just be aware and let it deepen in, and let it move through your being with your eyes closed or eyes closed, up, shut, open, I mean, you will, you will grow like a plant in the sunshine. So I think that's maybe the path to help others. And kids, God, kids bring us back to the sacred so quickly. I play tracks on the floor with my, you know, my little two-year-old grand, I got seven grandchildren and I love them so much because I, I just love being with them. I mean, we, we leave the world of grown up, responsible, important stuff and we're just where it's at. Okay, I probably blathered on enough. <laughs> Hope that was helpful. Um, I have a question yeah. about facing mortality, mm. and then we'll get you. But do you ha that? How does how do you see that? Who is an example of mortality um, being being looked at front on? My dad, when he was dying right, from cancer. Uh, he interesting. He he died in his seventy second year, which is where I am now. So I'm having these dreams about him. Uh, but anyway, when I went to see him in the last few days, you know, he he said to me, you know, I'm not afraid to die. I I have, I've seen the other side, and I'm going to die with my boots on. And I think the 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 deathbed visions, and my mother had them too. And I think there's so much more common than people. In fact, I saw a study that. On, on some palliative care organization from the East, I could find it if you wanted, that, that it says transcendent dreams, afterlife dreams, after visitors from the other side are so common that, that it really is like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says, you're not gonna die alone. I mean, there's someone's gonna be with you and come across to you and help you across. And I, I, so I think that dying 
is as we get to closer to dying, the veil between the worlds just gets thinner and thinner and you get visited more often in dreams. And, and I think there's a, the, the psyche knows how to die. The psyche has been doing it for millions of years. The psyche knows how to surrender to this process. And the more we let go of this idea that I have to be somebody or I have to be forgiven or I have to prove something before the end, that only causes pain. As we become silent, we silence our way into dying. And I think that's kind of okay. Does that, does that, yeah. yeah. Peter. I love your optimism about enlightened aging. However. However. Our society is addicted to youth. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. The, 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 their desire is to overcome aging and conquer it with creams and cosmetic surgery and vitamins. Billions of dollars. Billions of them, yeah. But the thing is, Peter, it only works for a while. In the end, aging wins. But it doesn't mean that you lose, it just means that we have to like surrender to this transformati transformational process because aging defeats the ego. It's just a fact. Right, uh, whether it's you wish you had your body at 35, yeah. or, uh, uh, you know, or the clarity of your purpose and energy that you had in midlife. Yes. But, you know, one of the tasks of aging is to feel into your aging body, I think, and realize that it has a great deal to teach you about oneness of awareness, just because you can't run around you without tripping. You, you, you have to stay much more present to movement, to slowness, and, and, and to appreciation of what I just think the gifts in that slower body are. Are, are ignored a lot, and they can be very wonderful. Well, it, it, it sort of intentionally brings your focus away from the body and toward the soul. Yeah, yeah as you move in ever deeper into that inner state of consciousness, yes. Yeah. And we're on the same page, I, you know. I think so many of us are. I think we just need a common language. That's what we don't really have in, in the aging process yet. Mm -hmm. Probably permission enough for that to be really um, spoken often. And yeah. share, the shared, the, shared um, the experiences are often the same, but the language, as you're saying, are. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the, uh, I guess, the four paths and also the way we understand about how the cosmos reinvents itself all the time or, or, or so that there's always an arc. There's an arc of energy coalescing into a being and then whatever it is, you know, if it's a mountain even, you know, it falls away and then becomes something else. Mm -hmm. So I think that is our lives too, you know, it becomes something for a while, has lots of energy about what it is and doing in our lives and then and then it starts to kind of fall apart, it just dissipate, the energy dissipates so it can be recreated in mm -hmm. some other way, right? And yeah. it does not die. It doesn't it always exists. There's no new energy. Yes. All energy that's yes. in there is still here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, Ramana Maharshi, the famous Hindu sage of the last century, you know, and when he was dying, everybody's crying and yelling and he was, he basically said to them, Where where do you think I'm going? <laughs> where would I go? I mean for him and, and for this stage if you're no longer this this body, it's okay to drop it, you know. And then whatever happens next will be whatever happens next because and it's okay because in this other, it's like out of body experiences in in when in, in crises, someone has a car accident and they're really mangled and they're floating above the body, the body, and they're saying, "Oh my God, don't rescue me! Don't rescue me! I've never felt so good in my life." You know, there's a sense of another kind of way of feeling and being. And the question, and the real question, I, I that uh, people who have afterlife experiences and come back is, is like, you know, you you go across and then do how much of that old life do you recreate again? Because it's it's what you're you're so you've so memorized, and how much can you let that go and continue transforming? I think the Buddhists would say that too. They would say that that first stage of meeting people on the other side, that's just the the, the, the ante room. You know, that's step one then a whole lot more happens. So, so it's good to die conscious, to be as conscious as you can in this dying process, mm -hmm. full of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody does it perfectly anyway. Well, there's no perfect way to do it. Well, can you, do you mind um, 
putting these towards the four paths of creation spirituality or would you sure. be able to talk to the three vocations that we have how do you you know, i mean you talk about the mystic being an activist by being yeah by being but how, how do you see that working in, in our tradition how does that our tradition well, well so i mean i know that we start with the via positiva but i really put that at the end because I think that we, we maybe started there as young children, but fairly quickly got all messed up with belief systems and ideas and identity. So, so it's like we, we create this, this idea about ourselves, and we worry about whether it's good enough or work so hard on it with, with you know, accomplishments and degrees and buying stuff. But, but then if at midlife it falls apart in a via negativa, and also at late life it falls apart, it falls apart lots of different times. And, and then if you go into the via negativa and you don't run away from it, you process it then, it, then you come back out with a brand new kind of creativity. So after midlife, you have this second half of life, which really, if you do it right, can become the work of the soul. And then in, in the late life crisis, you have this via negativity that, that if you can process it, you come out with a kind of creativity as a new blossom of who you are in the most spiritual way possible on this earth. So anyway, so you go from the via negativa to via creativa, and, the, and then the, the via transformer, no, via trans positiva, because you see where you are, because it's heaven on earth. The via positiva is heaven on earth at its highest level, at its most perceptive level. And then the transformativa is, is, the, is a mystical activist where you, because you see the divine world, you can see the ugliness that we impose on it with our stupidity and our actions and our ignorance and our cruelty. And, and because it's you, because you're no longer separate from it, you act. You do, you, you don't, it's like watching a two-year-old walking across a freeway. You don't say, I wonder what's going to happen. You, know, you cannot not act because you, you, you're connected to divinity. And that's that kind of impulse to action that happens when we've done our work. And who, in in your knowledge base, because you work with, a lot with the the conference, the Conscious Aging Network, mm -hmm. who's doing that sacred activism from an elder's perspective? The, the Conscious Elders Network is doing a lot of activism, but but it's not always from that from that particular framework. Although they have a mysticism branch that is that is working on. I'm trying to bring those two things together. I think they're doing really important work on trying to invite people into bringing mysticism and activism together in a way that doesn't uh, compete with itself. Sagey International's next conference in, in Minnesota in October is going to be, Matt Fox is going to be there too. And there's going to be a lot of work again on sacred activism. And, and um, I know um, Robert Ashley, who's a gerontologist, a well-known gerontologist and songwriter, is, is very involved with Sagey International. He, he talks a lot about this same kind of sacred activism. Lots of people are, are doing it. And, and, and the symbol, you know, you know about subliminal activism, David and Nicole's work? So here's a guy who, who, who is working on creating with people a, what he calls a coherent group field where you bring you know five or ten or a thousand people together and you do a, a, a an exercise where you really bring everybody's consciousness into one focus and and it deepens and it deepens and then from that focus you make it's like the maharishi effect you you focus it on making some kind of a difference in the world you know in the maharishi effect if you everybody meditates in a violent place the violence settles down appreciably measurably and so he's working on that it's called, it calls it sub, subliminal, you know, subtle activism. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of this stuff going on in the world. It's, it's kind of an exciting time to be bringing spirituality and, and activism together. And, and I think the elders who have such a longing to give back to the world, if they would just wait and not just jump into the first volunteer work that they're offered, but to, or else example lots of things until they discover what it what kind of work brings them to life brings them alive because then they will give something of their soul to the world so so many ways that we're giving back and the more people live to these later ages the more giving back we'll be doing mm -hmm. and you don't have to be heroic you don't have to save the world it's just take saving that you're your, the dog next door you know or, or being friendly to the cash register or lady or there's lots of so many ways to give back that we don't have to be heroic we just have to love John, what do you think of the Richard Rohr work about falling uh, upward? 
I don't know. I don't know much about his work, so I don't really have much to say. Do you want to say something about it? Well, it's just that it's the introduction to letting go and claiming your soul. Okay. You're going to let go of the world and all of its cares, and that it's a natural progression from midlife to eldering when you become more simple and more humble and therefore more open to transformation. I think it is a natural developmental sequence. It really is. I just think it also helps to have it named so you don't feel like you're crazy or you're alone, but, oh, this is the part where you begin to feel blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's very valuable. We're changing. And uh, check with uh, Beacon Press for getting your books published because there's a lot that the UUs are doing on aging. Well, you know, I, I gave a, I did a webinar for the UUs on the mysticism of aging, and and it, and thank you, <laughs> but we didn't get very many people to come to it. So we need to like get those people more interested. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll work on it. Thank you. I know you will. <laughs> uh, John, what uh, what do you think creation spirituality specifically? You talked about the other. Yeah. Things, what do you think we have? we who have studied creation spirituality have to give to this this discourse or this experience. well the mysticism i mean that's what it's all you know we may not focus on it nearly enough but creation spirituality is about the mystical experience literally and not just happening two thousand years ago but happening to people right now and also an experience that you can activate in mystical consciousness maybe not to the same degree but the same dimensions in, in creation spirituality, my God, the world is the divine. It's panentheism. It's, it's everything is sacred w w with consciousness. And so um, it just seems like we're the only people, apart from the native peoples, that, that really see that you don't have to go to church. The church is outside. The church is everywhere. And, and this is, I think, really important. Meister Eckhart and, and all the other mystics say stuff like this. They say, in my soul, God not only gives birth to me as his son, he gives birth to me as himself and himself as me. Our truest I is God. The divine self literally is in there. And if you quiet down and just bring your consciousness down in and wait and feel and sense, this thing starts to rise inside of you with so much love and insight and, and it carries you like, like a healing balloon up and out of yourself into the world. I mean, so creation spirituality is not locked into a, a narrow theological frame that says you have to do A, B, and C in order to be good enough. It's about liberating soul and dance and drumming and music and art and meditation and everything that frees you to be who you were born to be and why you came here. Mm. Mm, thank you. Ooh. I'm going to go back and, and I'm going to go back to this um, recording. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, thank goodness we're recording it. Welcome, Elizabeth. We are um, in the question and answer and reflection time. And um, I, I know you haven't had the benefit of the whole experience, but please feel free if you have a comment or question for John, um, please offer it um, as we have about 10 more minutes left. And if we don't want you to miss your opportunity, if you have something in mind. John, Elizabeth, I are you? Okay. All right. So no, nothing at this point. Uh, other comments, questions yeah, I, for John? I, I have a question for John. Um, it goes back to, um, I, and I, I may not have followed your story properly, but um, your, you talked about how it was so important that uh, you did the inner child work on yourself, but you also talked about how um, you did a lot of inner child work. With, um, clients when you were in full-time practice um, and I'm just wondering uh, from the shadow work side of psychology um, were you led to do inner child work because your big self knew that someday we were really going to need this work on ourselves? 
Did you follow that question? <laughs> I, I, well, you want to say it again? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you talked about your personal inner child work with your 14 year old self. Uh, but you also mentioned in your discussion how you did a lot of inner child work with your yeah. clients when you were in a yeah. uh, practice. Uh, and I wasn't sure the timing of those. Well, you know, me, a lot of times people are drawn to work because on a subconscious level, they know they need to do that work on themselves. I, I've no, I knew I needed to do work on myself from about the age of, I don't know, eight on <laughs> or 10 on. I always knew. And, and, I, and I, that's why I went into psychology, I'm sure, is I wanted to understand why I felt the way I did. And, and I knew I had these wounds, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do about them. And I didn't know how to heal them. And, and so as I worked more deeply on myself, I began, I was a much better therapist to work with other people. And, and so the inner child work, I mean, you know, I remember these specific traumas and I would, you know, it's just so important to let that trauma finish itself, feel it, bring it up, bring up the person, love them, heal them, let them out, let them integrate back again with you. Yeah, I, I just knew I needed it. You know, we're all broken and nobody I know is not wounded. So it's just a matter of finding a way to come home to yourself so that you can, you know, work this stuff through. Perhaps your 14 year old boy was wanting you to get the, to, was calling and longing for you to get to know your inner child long, well enough to finally find him. You know, the irony is that I had been in this training analysis therapy for like 10 years, you know, and so I brought up my, my heart surgery several times with this guy and we thought we'd worked it out. Wow. It was sparked so deep and so walled off that neither one of us knew that it was gonna come to <laughs> out again. It's the old peeling the onion skin. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you think you break down it, but what you've done is work on it enough so you can really work on it. You can work on it some more. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But John, how can we get your books? I have, again, here's, here's um, I don't see myself, but I'm holding this up. Though. Yeah, that's it. I think it's backwards. Um, the Three Secrets of Aging, also The Divine Human is your, these are the bookends of your work, but... Do we go to your website? Yeah, you can go to my website, which is johnrobinson.org. Okay. And you'll see all the books listed there. You can, you can, there are links there to Amazon, or you can go straight to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or, or your local books or get them anywhere you want. There are, there are six of them. The Finding Heaven Here, The Three Secrets of Aging, Bedtime Stories for Elders, What Aging Men Want, Breakthrough, which is my kind of autobiographical novel, and the last one, The Divine Human, which is our own, our own divinity. So I'm, ha and I instantly, you can always email me, you know, if you have questions or you want to talk some more or anything. I love these conversations. This is why I'm alive now. And in addition to my seven grandchildren and my, and my kids and my wife. <laughs> We have this John, family, it's a family, it's just it's the other half of everything. Yeah. Not everyone can go to that place of love uh -huh. that you talk about. And one of the steps I know that um, is really important in that is forgiveness. And what would you say, what could you say about that? I, I think we can't forgive too fast because it, 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 it is often an end run around the, the stuff underneath that. Uh, I have a brother I've been trying to forgive for a long time and I, and I keep coming up against these places where I, I just have to go deeper into what it is that happened between us that, that make it hard for me yet to, to forgive him. And I, so I think that start with forgiveness, but understand that that is not as simple often as you think. It's not a one step, you know, at, you know, thing like AA. You, you really got to live with it and, and go take your time to go deep into what, what happened and keep going back into it until you, until you finally hit the grief. I mean, underneath the problem with forgiveness is, is a defense against grief and shame. And you got to go to those places or, you can, or the forgiveness will, will, be, will be just defensive. Grief, shame, and, and terror. Wow. So I'm hearing that you can be love 
and still have that place that is not healed sure. with your brother. Absolutely, yeah. None of us are perfect. None of us have done it all. And, and it's a relief and to know that. Yeah, and what would you counsel about that place where, you know, if that's not love towards your brother, how do you hold it knowing what you know, having done the work you've done? How would you name that? That's not, if it's not love for your brother, or maybe it is, just how would you articulate that? You know, I feel like I'm, I'm somehow waiting for the other shoe to fall. That somehow doing it is, right now is, I tried is premature. It, ne it needs to go to the next step, and I'm not sure what that is. It may be that, that he, he, something happens to him and that opens my heart in a different kind of way. Or, you know, maybe something happens to me and it opens my heart in a different kind of way. And I also think it's okay. In the end, you don't have to work everything out, by the way. You know, there are some relationships you cannot, you won't heal in this lifetime. And, and don't beat yourself up about that. It's about letting go. It's about, you know, it, whatever you think is true becomes true for you. And if you think you can't be a good person without forgiving everybody, then you're going to be stuck in that particular karmic loop. In, in this state of more awakened awareness, that guy doesn't even matter anymore most of the time. Me, I'm talking about myself. Me and, and those problems with forgiveness is like irrelevant to almost anything because in that larger space, I don't even pay attention to him. He's, he's, he's sort of like a piece of paper that's sort of beginning to just fall, fall away. I, could I suggest that also the fact that you're worried still about that is uh, actually an expression of love? That if you were indifferent yeah. to the situation, yeah. Yeah. not be loved, but because <laughs> you're frustrated and you're hoping for the next yeah. shoe to yeah. fall and you're that, yeah. that no, I think you're right. Longing, longing yeah. for God. It's like longing for Exactly. Right. I think that was that's a very astute insight. You know, I, in one of my books I write about, I made this, developed this model of the religious psyche and its, and its four quadrants. And you look at these things different from each of these four quadrants. And so, but so when I'm in the quadrant of being in this dilemma, this, 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 created dilemma of him, me, and family, and whatever happened, and so forth, then I can still feel those feelings. When I'm in the quadrant of, of, of the divine, unmanifest God space, or in the, in the manifest God space of the divine earth, I don't, I mean, that stuff just has disappeared. And, but it doesn't mean it's gone, it just means that it depends on where you are in the cycle, and it's all a process of one day un unifying both sides, the left and the right side of the brain, so that you bring the, in the enlightened loving of the right side into the incredible intellectual ability, science, medicine, engineering. We, we, we've got some amazing stuff going on, on the left. It just needs to be softened and infused with the, the values and the love and the presence of the right. So, you know, it, this, this is the work I still, we're all still doing. Mm -hmm. Nobody has arrived, and there's no end run. <laughs> this has been nice well, about being a psychologist and also a, a minister, spiritual person, because it's like I'm not I'm not so naive as to believe that that the shadow just is gone forever, you know, or that you can be have a mystical experience and everything's fine. I've had seen people with great mystical experiences who come back and fight with their family again. You know, it's like it doesn't fix stuff like that until you work the material on both sides. It's continuous yeah. growth. The dance of it. The dance of it keeps going. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Well, we have about three minutes left. And John, let me just clarify. Did we have another song at the end or are sure, we, we could? Yeah, okay. yeah. you wanna do it, a quick one? Yeah. Right. Let me let me just kind of close up the verbiage, okay. and I want Gail and John, if you want to say more, to join in. Okay. Um, next month in June, on our third Thursday, I believe, um, we will be doing it a little differently, and that is that it will be um, sort of a, a, round, a circle in the sense that there will be no one person featured, but it will be our collective experience that will be 
engaging and reflecting and sharing about. And um, we're hoping that that people make time to to be the interviewee and um, we'll we'll all hear each other's story and um, learn about your aging and saging process. Gail, you want to say anything more about that? Uh, well, I was struck with what John said that he did with his affinity group at the gathering in Asheville, which was to say, what is aging like for you? We might, it could be as easy as that. We all don't have to, um, you know, come up with a treatise that to deliver, but you might have a special question. And if you have a question that you'd like everybody to, you'd like to hear other people's thoughts on, then send it to one of us um, and um, we'll uh, add it in. And, um, but it's, it's a chance for each of us to be the interviewee together as a group. And uh, you could send the question if you want to, to me, which is creation, spirituality, that's easy, Gail, my name, at gmail.com. If you don't have that uh, email address anyplace else. And I, I'm, I'm looking for, I think it's gonna be, this was yummy. This, I appreciated everybody's thoughts and, and questions and what a good discussion. And I think the next one will also be very good. I just wanna say that we are all sages we are all mystics. We are all wisdom figures. And so it's going to be fun. I mean, bring your saginess. Okay. Bring your songs if you got one. Bring your, songs. bring your poetry, you know, bring a piece of art. Bring whatever it is that, that is your way of being uh, an enlightened elder. Your favorite quote. Your favorite yeah. quote. Oh, that'd be good. That'd be good. So, so p picking up on Tom's theme of coming home. I have a song called Coming Home. Is Tom still there? Oh, that rascally laugh. Yes, I'm, I'm, oh, here. I'm Sing here. For, I'm singing for you. But he's still a rascal. <laughs> and John is, John yeah. is going to sing us off. So um, when, when his song fades, we'll be done. Any last minute comments before John starts? Yeah. Thank you all. It was wonderful. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, John. Thank you, all of our participants. Getting old, getting wise, waking up. Seeing the world with new eyes coming back to myself and my life coming home. Lost my way, lost my path, lost my soul. Felt this pain from my past, stumbled hard on a road that could not bring me home. Now this love that makes my life whole, this love that kindles my soul, it's this love that shows me the goal. No regrets. No goodbyes, cause I'm here with the sun in my eyes, with my kids and their kids in my arms coming home. Meeting friends sharing lives to the end 
We'll be telling no lies, hearts to mend. Making us wise, coming home. Now this love that makes my life whole, this love that kindles my soul, it's this love that shows me the goal. With her touch, she brings me peace. She takes my hand, and my world is complete. We are one, and our life is a feast coming home. Getting old, getting wise, waking up, seeing the world with new eyes, coming back to myself and my life, coming home. Coming home.